In J.K. Rowling's popular Harry Potter series, each year the students at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry are required to take a class in transfiguration. The young wizards are given lessons in incre of increasing complexity and how to wave their wands and turn something from one thing into another. In the opening class, the first year student Harry and his classmates, Professor McGonagall warns, Transfiguration is some of the most difficult and complex and dangerous magic you will ever learn at Hogwarts. Anyone messing around in my class will leave and not come back. You have been warned. Then she changed her desk into a pig and back. Well, that might be one kind of transfiguration, but it certainly is not the kind we hear about in today's gospel lesson. If the Harry Potter brand of transfiguration is going to be useful at all to us this morning, it will be as a foil to illustrate what Jesus' transfiguration is not. Changing from one thing into another and back again is not at all what's happening to Jesus. Nor is it the kind of magic that's commonplace at Hogwarts. Oh, something happens. Something happens for sure. Jesus' face begins to glow. His clothes turn bright white as the blazing center of the sun. And suddenly he's standing with two all-stars of ancient Israel, Moses and Elijah. So just what is going on? Well, today is a pivot day in the church year. In the epiphany season that we've been observing for, for nearly two months now, Jesus' power and glory have been revealed in his teaching and his healing. In just three days on Ash Wednesday, we will begin the season when his glory will be hidden and yet revealed in his suffering and death. And so at this pivot point, this mountaintop that stands between the two seasons of the church year, we get to see in dazzling glory who Jesus has been all along. God, come among us. One scholar wrote that in this moment, we get to see Jesus inside out. I love that phrase. We get to see Jesus inside out, seeing who he has been all along, but now his dazzling divinity on display for those disciples and for us to see. We see in this dazzling splendor who Jesus has been all along. God, come among us. Though the transfiguration is intended to be a revelation of Jesus' identity as God's own son, it doesn't seem to reveal much at all to those three disciples with Jesus. Peter is so overcome by the experience that he begins babbling in silly talk, building some little huts for Jesus and Moses and Elijah as if he wants to make the moment last forever. I'll give Peter this much credit. He must have understood that there was at least something important going on even if he could not understand exactly what it is. And so he takes the natural course. Make it last. Prolong it. Soak in the comfort of the present moment. But we know that the work that Jesus came to do would not be accomplished in the glory and the comfort and the dazzling radiance of the Mount of Transfiguration. Difficult and challenging days lie ahead for Jesus. The difficult and challenging days would be the time when Jesus' mission gets accomplished. That's a tension for us as individuals and as the church too. To bask in the comfort of the present moment, even when God calls us into a challenging future, there is always a tension in the church between the comfort of now and the challenge of what's next. But we still haven't penetrated to the heart of the matter. The magic-like display of glory is prelude to the voice from the heavens that gives confirmation of Jesus' identity as God's beloved Son. It's the same voice and the same words that now echo from Jesus' baptism. 
They come at this critical time when Jesus will go down from the mountain, turn his face towards Jerusalem, and this increasing tension with the religious authorities. He's going to turn his no longer glowing face towards Jerusalem for the completion of his mission. The completion will not end with magic or miracles, but with his cruel death on a cross. And the voice points us to what we ought to be paying attention to. This one, this Jesus, this one whose clothes and countenance glow like the sun is the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the one sent to accomplish salvation for all of creation. And so the voice tells us to pay attention to what he says, not what he looks like, not the dazzling brilliance of his clothing. It's his message that is the light shining in the darkness. And that prophetic message continues to shine the light of God's redeeming grace and mercy into this present darkness and reinforces those words, this is my son, listen to him. We live in a culture that is not very good at listening. There are so many competing voices, who do we listen to? And what makes it even harder is that is that we're told that it's more important to get our voice out there than to listen to what anyone else has to say. And so we got Facebook and Twitter and email and Snapchat and texting. Never mind the barrage of information that comes to us on screens and in print, CNN, Fox News, PBS, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and what seems like a thousand others. It can be so overwhelming that we are tempted to tune it all out. But not this one. Don't tune this one out. Not this one whose words bring life. In the midst of all the noise, listen to him. In a world so full of death, his words don't just tell us about life. They bring us life. Listen to Jesus. Listen to God's Son, the Beloved. Listen to Him in the splash and refreshment of baptism. Listen in His Word. Listen in the Eucharistic meal. Listen in this community. Listen to Jesus. <clears throat> the Transfiguration confirmed the identity of Jesus proclaimed at His baptism. A confirmation that will be so important to Jesus when he's in that garden of Gethsemane, when he's walking that pathway to, the, to his trial, and when he's bearing the sins of the world there on the cross. He will need this confirmation of who he is. The question of identity is an important one for us to consider also on this mountaintop Sunday. In our various places in life, we try on a variety of identities. Some of us are at the, both, at, at the same time both children and parents. Some of us are spouses. We are engineers, attorneys, farmers, or administrative assistants, and at the same time we are the neighborhood handyman, the master gardener, or the champion volunteer. We are white, black, brown, yellow, straight, gay, or trans, Republican, Democrat, socially progressive and fiscally conservative and vice versa. At the drop of a hat, we will wear our various university sweatshirts or the regalia of the culture socks, bears or packers, all of which become our own color-coded version of dazzling raiment. We are proud to proclaim to the world this part of our identity. And yet none of it tells who we are. Who are we? The various identities that we try on often are nothing more than a dazzling display of temporary allegiance. They don't tell us who we are. Our most true identity comes as a gift from the one who this day is revealed in his dazzling glory. The vocal confirmation of that voice from the cloud that tells us that Jesus is God's beloved Son. It points forward to his death and resurrection 
And that's what brings the life that changes us, that pronounces us God's sons and daughters, that transfigures us from death to eternal life. If the transfiguration echoes Jesus' baptism, then it also echoes the voice that is spoken at every one of our own baptisms. You, beloved, are the precious sons and daughters of God. You have been made holy. You, child of God, have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. In this epiphany season just past, we have heard some challenging lessons from Jesus about how to live as a child of God in a world that is so often blind to God's purposes. And we are about to enter into this season of Lent, a season in which we are invited into a little spring house cleaning in our relationship with God, invited, as the prophet says, to return to the Lord with all our hearts. On this day, this pivotal moment, the dazzling display of glory reminds us that it is ever, only, and always about Jesus. It is about Jesus' identity as God among us. It is about his work of redemption that required his cruel death and came to full blossom in his resurrection and gave life to all creation. It is ever, only, always about Jesus and our life ever only always in Jesus.